welcome to the Trusted Seed Spotlight. The Trusted Seed is a community of reputable and experienced nerds in blockchain tech and commons management that are driven to support new ways of coordinating around public goods and common pool resources. And uh, since it's commons month, there's no better person to give the spotlight to than Michelle Balance. Of course, uh, Michelle Balance is a prolific author, uh, founder of the Peer to Peer Foundation, and one of, if not the foremost researcher in using peer to peer tech to build commons infrastructure. Uh, so it's my honor, Michelle, to welcome you to the show. Great, yeah, I, I, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm a very enthusiastic supporter of the commons stack and I, you know, I just mentioned it like every other day as, as you know, a key, a key uh, important project. Uh, well, and and uh, we're very influenced by your work, so I'm not surprised. Um, but uh, but yeah, so where you know in the spotlight, we want to dive into like who you are and how you ended up here. So like, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? And how did you find right. this like really nascent field of study? How did you find yeah, yourself? So so um, so you know, just start with childhood. I had a pretty tough childhood. Uh, my my mother was you know uh, illiterate. Um, my father, um, you know, they both went to school until they were 13, they were both workers. And so I grew up in a house that had leaking, uh, you know, leaking roof and I got sick. And I got taken away from my parents when I was 18 months old. I got this mother bronchitis. And, you know, I remember horrible things like having to eat my vomit and being in a glass house and having nails like three centimeters long. So, you know, so I had a very pretty tough childhood and, you know, I to overcome like trauma and stuff. And, and, and uh, uh, on, on the other hand, I was also lucky, you know, because uh, I, you know, I don't know if you're an anarchist, I'm, I'm not. So, uh, you know, I was, I'm a product of the, the welfare state and the good part of the welfare state. So I had free education, free medicine. My parents got, you know, like housing for zero percent um, with zero percent uh, credit, right? So you, you know, you you just had to pay the rent, and that was paying back your your loan. There was no uh, no extra to pay back. Um, so you know, one so I, after I was six, you know, there was the the boom years, the, the you know the golden thirties, uh, the thirty years of the you know when things were going well. Um, and I studied political science, international relations. And, you know, I was pretty rebellious. I was like hypersensitive to injustice. And, and uh, I was once diagnosed as uh, hyper empathetic. There's a name for that, but I forgot, you know, like you, uh, you just feel what other people feel. And, you know, I, I tell you, it's not Empathic. good. <laughs> yeah, you know, like hyper empathy. It's, I think it's, that's what it's called. And, so, and, and this was all in, where, where did you grow up exactly? Was this in Belgium? Okay, in Belgium, in uh, like a suburb of Brussels, uh, a Flemish suburb. I spoke French at home with my mother, Dutch with my father, and I went to a Flemish speaking school. Um, you know, stayed 12 years in the same school, then graduated at the Free University of Brussels. But, you know, at that time, it was a really good university. Uh, like, and I, I had very left-wing professors, uh, you know, Ernest Mandel, who was the leader of the fourth international, the Trotskyist uh, movement. And I was a Trotskyist back then. Um, and uh, I did that for seven years. And then I felt like this is not working. After seven years, I said, okay, I, I, I'm not happy. I think the world is not a good place. I, you know, that's how I thought. <laughs> and... So I need, if I can do the revolution outside, I have to do the revolution inside. So after, you know, three years, I, I quit and then I started Eastern stuff. So I, you know, I did meditation, Tibetan, Zen. Um, and I did a lot of things, but not like a consumer. I was really looking for, you know, like the answer, you know, like what's the meaning of life? How, you know, how can I be happy? And, and uh, so I did all these things. I, I ended up with Osho. You know, I went to Russian Ishpuram in Oregon. Wow. I, if you watch the documentary uh, Wild Wild Country, it's amazing. Yeah. You have to watch it. I was yeah. there. I was wow. there. You know, so I, I know this story very very well. Um, and then I think uh, you know I have to go to business because you know what else what else should I do? But then I I started working for the top management of British Petroleum Division Nutrition, and it's. It was at that time the biggest animal feed company in the world with 25,000 people. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I visited one of these factories. I was so disgusted by the animal treatment. I became a vegetarian for 80 years. <laughs> I was just like, oh no, this is just, just not possible. But my job was interesting because I was working for like the top 25 people of the company. And in the morning, you know, they would come to me and say, oh, can you prove to me that, uh, you know, we need to do X. And then three hours later, the other, the other faction would come to me and say, well, can you prove to me that X is bad and now we should do Y, right? So I had to constantly like take multiple perspectives and that was like an amazing training. I was already trained as a librarian, but you know, to be like in these high level strategic games, that was like fascinating for me. And I actually closed the library and created the first virtual library, functional virtual library in the world. And wow. so I was the first librarian. And <laughs> you, you know, if you look in Google, you might still find it. And I got some awards, two awards, and and. Um, and what anyway, was the so, topic? What was the topic that you were especially collecting information on? Um, well, you know, basically competitive intelligence, like. You know how do you survive uh, with changing work practices and people are consuming differently so it was very broad like anything a company needs to know to like you know be with it and not not miss the important trends and and to know that what the others are doing in the same sector you know where their capital is coming from and and who's investing in them and you know everything so very broad very interesting uh and after three years they closed down you know instead of you know i didn't want to go to another country and so then i created a magazine called wave which was like a mix of mono 2000 and wired um, cool. and i did that for a year and a half we were growing but the publisher didn't think we were growing fast enough and then two startups uh one called Ecom, which was about intranets and extranets. And this, which, you know, did like two, three years and then I sold it uh, to a holding company in Belgium. And then I went to, uh, I created a second one called the Kyberco, which was about virtual marketing, but like ethical tribal marketing. And that went very well until 2000, the, the, you know, the internet uh, bubble, and then yeah. it collapsed. And so we lost 90% of our um, of our clients, and like we just didn't have the capital to continue. So I sold it to Alcatel, like we was like a big French, you know, telco type company. And then I worked for US Web CKS, you know, because I I needed to do something, and that was founded by Joe Fermage who is a guy who believes in reverse engineering alien technology. Uh, you know, wow. he had two billion, so he could believe what he wanted. And he, you know, he made all yeah. these claims. It was weird. And he was the guy who funded Ken Wilber. Do you know Ken Wilber? Yeah. Yeah, he funded Ken Wilber. You know, the like wow. the, well, yeah, makes the sense. Integral Institute is Sounds money like from Joe Fermich. Um, You know, I never met him live, but, you know, on... on you know, Zoom, not Zoom calls, but that didn't exist yet, but stuff like that, right? Yeah. yeah. So then I was uh, headhunted to be the director of strategy of uh, digital transformation for the largest telco in Belgium called Belgacom. In the in 96 or 97, I got an, an immense burnout, you know, so I went really deep. And then my company, I found out they were stealing money. I had a fight with Ken Wilber, my father died, my mother got Alzheimer. And so I really collapsed, um, you know, and, but that in the end was a good thing because what I felt was some people will have, you know, a collapse or, and he calls them twice born people. These are people who are not well in the world. And I, that was really, you know, my case, right? Like, you think something is wrong with the operating system. Like this can be the way it was meant to be, right? So you're not happy, you're always searching for, you know, but you really need to fall down totally. before you can get up, right? You see, basically it's like an internal deconstruction that happens. And when you, 
And the thing is, if one thing goes wrong in your life, you can always hang on to another. But in my case, everything went wrong at the same time in the same year. And so then you're like, you're in free fall. And then you say, well, if I don't change, I'm dead, right? And I'm already 40, so I'm still not happy. And so that was really like a rebirth. And so I came out of that with the, with the idea, you know, I, I'm not happy in business. I think the world is not working as it should. Yeah. And I want to do something about it. And no longer like when I was 20, like with rage and resentment, but, you know, like more like I have a surplus that I want to use to, uh, to do that. And so this was before Belhacom, but so, you know, in my mind, let's take this job, make a lot of money. You know, I was paid very well. These, these last three years were really like really good. Yeah, I mean, you were early internet, so you had to be doing yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I did integration of all the internet companies for them, you know, like interviewing all the CEOs of all the small companies they had bought and then like device strategy uh, to integrate them. But I quit. So I, and so the idea was, you know, Marxism doesn't really work. So what, what would work? You know, and I came up with this theory of seed forms, right? That that you have these cycles. You know, basically it's, it's an extractive regenerative cycle. So you have market state formations, which are inherently extractive. They're competing with others to be top dog. And in order to win, they have to do it. They can't, there's no option. You have to need more, you need more energy than, than the competition. You need more material, need more people. And so they're, you know, they're really extractive mechanisms, right? And so what they always do, not exceptionally, but as a rule, is they exhaust their own basis, mm. right? That's why all civilizations collapse and, and are now reborn eventually. But in the moment of reaction, that's when the commons come in, because what the, you know, the people are close to the land you know, and they need to survive, they're going to say, but we can't continue like this. And so usually there will be like spiritual reformers, right? And they will say, no, 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 you know, this is this is the devil, we need to do it this way and, and or whatever. And so they recreate common centric civilizations or healing periods. You know, most of the dark ages are actually these common healing periods. They're dark because there's a much less surplus yeah right maybe there's no writing or whatever but actually people pay no taxes they can eat their own food they live in their own villages and they start protecting you know the local their local environment and the the paradox is then you know their very success will lead to a new period of extraction because they will create a surplus wow. that will create cities and the cities start exploiting the farmers and and there there it goes off again right so I call this the pulsation of the commons. And so, but the key is like every new phase is based on seed forms. Like if a, if a system no longer works, then obviously you're not gonna solve the issue by following the same system. You're gonna leave the city, you know, you're gonna found a monastic community or you're gonna be a warlord, whatever, but you're gonna, you're gonna invent new things because the old ways don't work, right? Mm -hmm. And so you create all these seeds and then the seeds come together, create subsystems. And eventually there is some kind of, you know, more radical transformation where the subsystem becomes a meta system. My, my view is revolutions occur when oh, the cool. ruling wow. classes are not flexible enough, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can't change it gradually, then you get pressure and then it just explodes and, and, and it's, a, it's a violent explosion. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be, you know, if you look at, you know, I looked at like the bourgeois revolutions and, you know, they're very different from one from another. And, you know, there's, there's different ways to do it and not necessarily like the Russian revolution or the French revolution. Um, but the important thing is the seed form is that even if you have a revolution, it has been preceded by all these people inventing the new, right? And so my, my thesis was, and I think I'm correct still, is that the commons and peer-to-peer was the format for the new civilization, right? So that's what people are doing who are kind of, even either they are forced out of the system or they voluntarily leave the system or they're idealistic, whatever they are. But these are the people creating the new. 
And I say, well, you know, change your change your vision, not to the things that are disintegrating, but to the things that are being constructed, right? And that will give you energy and hope and stamina. So look at the end of the tunnel, right? You yes, we are going through a dark period of disintegration and you know transvaluation of everything and. Yes, it's hard. It's awful, but we're going somewhere. <laughs> the the P to peer wiki and peer to peer foundation. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the wiki is basically my baby, and and uh, you know what I'm saying is, even if I'm totally wrong myself, here's the documentation. Make up your own mind. But this is really happening. So I, I only take things in my wiki that are really happening. Sometimes experiment experimental. But no ideas, like no, no people say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it, no, no, that doesn't come in. I, I need to yeah. know that somebody's doing it. Somebody's oh, that's really actually working on something. And, and I'm, I'm really curious, uh, one of your projects that's probably, I don't know, one of the most famous, I think, is the Peer to Peer Foundation. Uh, and like, how did that come to be? And where, where has it, you know, tell us the story. You know, I did all my studies, I started, I opened the blog, I opened the wiki. And in November 2005, okay, so it was really built around the wiki and the blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In okay, November 2005, means... I got my first invitation to uh, an activist conference in Budapest, you know, funded by Soros. And, you know, from one thing came another, I got invited once and then twice. And then, you know, I ended up like in 2013 traveling seven months a year, doing like 120 conferences wow. in one year. Wow. And you know, so until the break in 2018 and then with COVID, you know, I was like always on the road and it became unsustainable. So by the time that COVID came, I started forgetting people's faces. I was tired. Uh, I said, what am I doing? You know, I, so I, I tend to get into because I'm over enthusiastic. So, you know, I have these seven year cycles, two years and a half, high passion. Two years and a half, yeah, it's good, cool. it's okay, it's great. And then I feel I'm starting to overdo it at the end. And then, you know, if I want to avoid a new burnout, I had to, you know, and luckily COVID, <laughs> luckily, yeah, uh, but COVID came in the right time for me. It's like- It, it turned off okay, the world so for I'm, you. Yeah. So to, to just close with the P2P foundation, it's still there. It's attracting a lot of attention. You know, all these people around in the network are still producing great stuff. You know, it's just that as a group, I'm a bit like I I prefer not to bring my struggle, you know, because it's a very, very contentious thing, right? It's uh, yeah, so I polarize. Right. Okay, you do your stuff, you know. I'm I'm particularly concerned by this, it's my thing, and I can't help it. This is what I have to do. And I'm doing both. But yeah. in a way. Uh, and this is what I wanted to say is that, you know, there, there's a pattern of people with good intentions in ending up in really bad spaces. This is, you know, and you can't always blame the outside. Oh, it's capitalism. No, 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 no. I, you know, I was in three communes and we, we failed three times, you know, and it wasn't capitalism, it was us, right? <laughs> And so I was, so I, so I had this project it's called Civilization Analysis and to place the history of the commons in that thing, but also to look at the dark side, right? I want to look at the dark side. So I'm reading René Girard. So what I'm rejecting now is this idea of, you know, the noble savage. And if only we take away, you know, the superstructure, then we will all be brothers and sisters. And, and yeah. I've seen it happen too many times. I'm too old for that like no no it doesn't work you can't dream you have to really confront the dark side and especially your own scapegoating uh projections you know yeah. like it's your fault it's your fault no no you have like you have to work through this shadow and you know Thank i you. did a lot of shadow work for 14 years so i you know i don't want to continue doing like no, but now I'm looking to like the world shadow, you know, like, yeah. I mean, if um, so that's what I'm doing. And I, you know, it's not that I have all the answers, 
If, if you're going to design a building, you need to prepare for earthquakes and fires. Exactly, and exactly, exactly. If you're going to yeah. design a human system, you're going to have to design for the problems that humans right. have. I, yeah. I think, uh, I think that's you know, economics is a social science, and and we have to yeah. remember. That. Yeah. So, for example, you know, like when I think about common stack, I'm thinking about what you're doing, and I have this idea of, you know, we need to develop anti-oligarchic protocols. So my, my theory is, and it's, you know, it's a very pessimistic theory, and, and that's a critique on libertarianism, is that every competition for a scarce resource leads to concentration. There is no exception in history. Whatever is scarce, whatever is competitive, you know, it's an iterative game, and people end up with a Pareto uh, distribution. It just happens every time. So you can complain about that or say people are evil, or you can say, well, can we develop mechanisms, you know, that cream, regularly cream the top and, yeah. and recreate the distribution. And that, of course, in a sense, that was taxation is about that, you know, progressive taxation. But, you know, nation states are very weak, but you could also say like Jamendo is doing with music. Uh, I don't know if it still exists, but, uh, you know, it was a rather brilliant design. So you choose music, Right, and every vote is a vote. But then, after one thousand votes for a song, you need two votes for the next thousand, mm. and then four votes for the next thousand, and eight votes for the next thousand. Right, mm. so that creates a surplus of votes that you can then, you know, sprinkle on on people who don't get any votes at all. So because what you get in Amazon and stuff is Spotify, you know, is winner take all dynamics. Yeah, but in Gemendo, you didn't have that, right? It, it it stayed, it remained like a distributed music system because it had this. I don't know if it was successful in other ways, but you know, medieval cities did that. You know, the free cities of the Middle Ages. That's what they did to you know to keep the the guild democracies for three centuries. You know, eventually they failed as well. But you know, Ghent, Brugge, Ven Venice. You know, Venice is a republic that lasts one thousand years. Wow amazing you know they're lost because of the they didn't the cannons didn't work and you know uh so they eventually lost eventually in the 1900s or in the 1800s day but you know, imagine that a city that wasn't perfect no. was ruled by a coalition of oligarchs but not one and yeah. that was able for 1000 years to don't have civil wars and you know they had these extraordinary methods of voting to avoid collusion and and so we've forgotten that and we need to relearn that we need to and so that's what i think i don't know if you if you formulate it that way but that i think that's what you're doing that's oh, what wow. you're looking well, for that's definitely that's what i think ah well thank you for that compliment for sure uh it's a huge compliment uh but you know, you know quadratic, sort of... quadratic voting and quadratic voting yeah. they're entirely in that kind of frame you know it's like what can we do to avoid hyper concentration yeah you know, so that we and... can uh, a long-term inclusive and participatory project that doesn't you know the, uh, there's a couple of stories that i just can't let you leave without telling All i right. can't michelle i can't you have to tell me about how the uh, Bitcoin white paper ended, how oh. you ended up participating with Bitcoin. I, was it in 2009 that, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto posted on our Ning Foundation. So it's P2P Foundation Ning.com. And he, you know, he posted the, the paper. And I've heard many times it was the first time. Now some people are claiming that it was like a, a cypherpunk place. Or, but I think it's so let's put it that way. Out. It's probably the first public posting, right? Not on a private mailing list, but on a public forum. So I think that is correct. And he also wrote to us, and you know that was my first mistake. He offered me bitcoins, and I didn't reply. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> what a lot of stupid thing to do <laughs> yeah you know, i'm sure it would have been hundreds i just don't think about money right and and it's just i don't have that dna so uh i just need money not to think about money right but so i just don't think about it and you know i i probably saw that i just didn't register um so he also wrote to our mailing list p2p research and he offered some bitcoins and then 
the next thing, uh, but you know, I was struggling with Bitcoin. I wasn't like immediately a fan. I, you know, I wrote critical pieces because of this, especially because of this oligarchic, you know, proof of stake, proof of work. I kind of like said, you know, this is going to lead to a very concentrated ownership. And it has. Uh, and it has. Um, and, but at the same time, I, I said from the very beginning, this is historical because it's the first socially sovereign money system. In other words, it's legitimacy it doesn't come from the state, but from a virtual community. And that's a historical advance. Even though I critique the Bitcoin, I think this is like, it's the first of a series. And, sim and, and the same thing with the blockchain, you know, I can critique the energy stuff and no, but the blockchain is the shift from an internet of communication to an internet of transaction. And so it creates an, a public ledger that can be used for ecosystemic accounting. And this again is historical. There's a before and there's an after, right? That's why oh. you know, I can critique things at the same time say, no, no, I critique it for this and this, but at the same time, you know, and 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 a lot of people don't do either one or the other. You know, they either Resonance can't hear any critique or they can't see anything good in it. And, you know, that's tiresome. No, you have to, anyway. Of course, that could be wrong, but that's... So then he... he uh, okay, Mt. Gox happened. And, you know, because we were talking about Bitcoin and stuff, we got donations, which were worth $300,000. And, you know... And it's like a Tuesday, and I, you know, I tell my colleague in the Netherlands who was managing the, the thing, he said, you know, shouldn't we start selling some? And I said, no, 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 leave it there. And the next day it was gone. So we lost oh. everything. And imagine 300,000 in the year of Mount Gox, how much that would have been. So yeah. I've been jinxed. I've been jinxed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then uh, he rewrote to us in... Uh, when this Japanese guy was in the nose. Yeah. And he just said very simply, I am not him. Yeah. Okay. And then like maybe nine months ago, he wrote again. Really? But, he, and he said, you know, uh, like you can expect something, but I never saw anything after that. And... And of course, people now say that maybe his email has been hacked, so we can no longer actually affirm yeah. with certainty that, you know, it's him. I don't know. But it's the same email. Like, it's the same email that he wrote in 2009. Now, I don't know him personally. I never met him personally. But yeah. you know, there is this thing, this special thing that, that he thought the P2P Foundation was, you know, worthy of of doing that with us yeah and, and, know, and very legitimately i mean you guys especially in the early 2000 2010s you know like it yeah. was huge it was just uh it was the it was the premier place to go for uh yeah. this kind of research and I, I feel like it still has a, a lot of that uh opportunity it's, i mean at least you know i'm not a tech tech guy i follow tech right i'm a tech observer but you know i'm i'm not at all like and is this is this your most recent project? Is this the seeds of common? Well, I, I saw you wrote this paper that I can't not ask you about. It's called the seeds of the commons, peer to peer alternatives for planetary survival and justice. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? That seemed to be your most recent work. So capitalism, you know, has worked for four centuries. And it has escaped its issues by moving around because it was the first global system. And so you exhaust one place, but it's not a problem. You can go every, somewhere else. The problem is now they've, they've really exhausted everything, right? And this actually means that the pulsation can no longer work, that we actually need to find some kind of stable, steady state system. And that's what I call cosmolocalism. So we now have a fight between two alternatives. One is you know, multicultural neoliberalism, which is becoming woke. So I call it woke neoliberalism, yeah. you know, and it's based on allocating things according to your, your, your group. You know, this is, this is what they want. So you're, you're, you know, what you, you have a certain characteristics and so 13% for these. And so it's a way for me to diversify the ruling class to, you know, to create more support for the ruling class because they're losing it. They're, you know, they've lost their legitimacy. Totally. Um, 
so and and so the Davos, you know, the Davos uh, thing is basically the plan, right? It's to create a world that is run by public-private partnerships with officially sanctioned NGOs, and you know, and they will rule domains, you know, and make deals with, but and the state will be weak, and will shall will be a little part of this kind of global order. So you know, it's not a, I don't have a conspiracy theory about them. You know, they they say it openly, and it makes a lot of sense from their point of view. You know, like a, a neoliberal sharing economy. That's what they want. Uh, but it's I don't think it solves a lot of issues. You know, for the majority. Um, and then the reaction to this is national populism. Is saying no, we don't want this globalism. Uh, we need to return to the nation state. We need to protect our communities, and you have this, and you know, you the, back to the nation state. Eventually, it's solidarity only for the citizens, and it's of, attractive to many people. And you know, you have the somewheres and nowheres, right? So the this is a book by David Goodhart. So the the somewheres are people who working class. They tie to their locality. They can't escape because they they don't have education. They don't have money. And so they're facing the full brunt of neoliberalization and deindustrialization, right? And they're moving to the right. They used to be left, they used to vote for the left parties. Now they're moving to the right and they vote for people like Trump and, and Orban and because it's an alliance between the, the nowheres and the, let's say the localized section of the, of the business class. So what's the, what's the solution? So the solution for me is what I call cosmo-local uh, globalism or localism, right? So the thing is, so first we need to relocalize. Why we do need to, we need to relocalize? Because we spend three times as much on transport and on making, right? So in terms of our ecological crisis and climate crisis, we, you know, I'm not saying we go to zero, but I call it the subsidiarity of material production. So you, you, we rethink like if. If you have very good butter in Patagonia, you don't buy it in New Zealand because it might be cheaper in money, but it's actually much more expensive in thermodynamic cost, right? And the money doesn't show that. Yeah. Because things are not priced to their real value. Um, so, so cosmolocalism means you know distributed manufacturing, local manufacturing, but connected to these global open design communities, right? So you have a local fair BNB, and you you mutualize the provisioning systems, um, and and but and so then you have a local coalition of the city, the business sector, the NGOs, and the uh, research sector ally to help this new sector which is the, you know basically the common sector civic innovation and the yeah. basic idea that i defend is today civil society is productive right there's more intelligence and innovation in the civil society than in the state and the business sector yeah so there has to be they have no money it has to be right so that so you move from a commodity framework to a contribution and impact framework and in an impact is the negative of contribution. It's, it's just a negative contribution. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to simultaneously transform, you know, the civic society by empowering it through civic infrastructures. We need enabling public mechanisms, and I, you know, I think about public ledgers a lot. So instead of always competing, you open a ledger and say, okay, you decarbonize. We will support you. And these companies who are creating the carbon, they will pay you. And you don't need to compete with others. You just say what you do. And if you're better, you get more for sure. But yeah. it's, you know, you know, it's different. Um, competition, and you, and doesn't opens, make, competition doesn't make sense when you're creating abundance for society. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, uh, it, so it's you know, that's what the game B thing is about, right? It's how do you design win-win frameworks? So there's still competition, but it's it's the higher framework is the cooperation. And now we have the opposite. We have competition, and within competition, we have cooperation. So you know, in a multinational, people cooperate very well, but against other multinationals, and, and it's just flipping that around. Yeah. Right. So this and and so you still have pe people are good at things and people are not so good at things, and you know, and, and people are lazy and less lazy, 
So, you know, I don't, you, you don't want to discourage good people from being better than the average. So you have to combine this. You don't destroy the competition. You, you just get a, a new holder, you know, that it can operate without destroying, basically. Um, and so, you know, this, this support coalition at the local level, you fractally, combi you fractally uh, copy it at a trans-local level. So the, the global design community is also supported by an international organization, impact investors, co-ops, solidarity economy. So you kind of, and so that means that you have people who are local, right? Like uh, let's say permaculture, you have your feet in the mud, you're connected to your community locally, but you are participating spiritually in this value community that operates at a translocal scale. Right. So more of a cause. So the, state, the state doesn't disappear, but instead of just attracting capital, which is the neoliberal game, you attract knowledge. You, you make sure, and this is where I use the word everywhere, right? That's us. People who are both connected to these global things, but we can help the locals. So we're not just nowhere saying, oh, we don't care. No, no, we are everywhere. So we we try to combine our roots and, you know, but we can move around. So we have the role of the guilds in the middle ages, you know, where the masons would build a cathedral and then would move to another city. And so they would enrich every city with their knowledge, right? So, so that's the role I, I give to the blockchain people, to the, especially the commons oriented blockchain people is that they can play this kind of glue that helps local communities, you know, get the most out of this transnational cooperation. And so in this third, you know, I call it the third way, you still have nations and, you know, because we need some kind of physical governance anyway, you can call it, you know, call it something else if you want, you know, but we need some kind of territorial governance. The police, you know, like the Greek city-states, but we also have these virtual countries, right? And so the key design issues is how do we combine this? And that's why you know, I think the, the solution is cosmolocalism as the ideal combination of the virtual with the, with the local. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful that's vision. Who, what, which projects are you looking at these days most that, that kind of mm, follow these Comes trends? <laughs> um, but there's got to be others. Yeah. I'm sure there's others. Um, well, I look at Sensorica. Um, but you know we have a book. It's called Cosmo Local Reader, and we have hundred case studies. I'll, I'll let me give you one. It's maybe not spectacular, but so you know there's still a lot of poverty in India, and you have all these villages that don't have light and electricity. And you know these kids, it's dark at six. You know they they can't really do their homework, and so they excluded right from the system. Yeah. So there's this project called Solar Lamps, and it's a global design, but it's produced in India. And then it's given, or maybe sold at a very low price, I can't remember, to these villages. So suddenly you have 4 million people that have access to electricity and can do their homework, which is then connected to a system that is run by the uh, Mumbai, uh, you know, it's like the M uh, MIT in Mumbai, what is it called, the IIT, I think it's called, in Indian in Institute of Technology, and Mumbai is the biggest one. So they have a system where people can take these 10 minute courses, um, you know, very structured and they can do it in the villages because now they have internet and because they have the electricity and then they have exams and tests and when they do well, they can join the university. You see, so this is, and it's open source, right? So this combination of things like makes a huge difference in the life of these people, but it's, it's not private. It's not exclusive, you know, it can be done by everyone, but you still have little companies that can make it and sell it. So you actually create an economy as well. Nice. So that's the stuff I'm looking at. And this is, you know, I think this is the future. And I, yesterday I spoke, um, that video is going in French, it's going to be uh, available soon. So it's like 100 maker spaces and they got 30 million euro from the French government and the Banque de Territoire, which is a, um, like the Bank for Regional Development to develop a regional development policy that is centered around the maker spaces. 
to recreate this type of economy. So this is very interesting, right? Because, you know, the makerspace for me is an anthropological revolution, right? So you have Descartes and he says, yeah. you know, mind and matter and the managers and engineers ma manage the workers and the workers obey and, and execute, right? But in a makerspace, you have somebody who thinks about the design, designs it, produces and then thinks about what it has produced. So what you have created in a makerspace, I call it the Brahmin worker. You know, and so you know about the Indian uh, ideology, you know, the Kali Yuga, right? We we're in the Kali Yuga, it's the end of a cycle. And the new cycle is supposed to be the Brahmins again. But I'm saying, well, with a twist, you know, it's the Brahmins and the workers kind of merged into a new type of human being, which is both practical and educated at the same time. And so by by generalizing these projects, so Okay, 100% organic food in the city. You have, like in Ghent, 5 million public school children that need meals in a year. Okay, so now they, they buy it from a multinational, it's full of additives and colorants and you know, makes them sick and it's crap. So why don't you replace this with a contract with the, you know, with the organic farmers around the city? So you stimulate the local healthy economy. Then you take zero carbon cargo bikes, zero carbon, you create work for the bikers, right? Then in the schools, you need cooks again, and you need the geeks who manage the, the, the digital system. So you have created a system where the cognitive people and the physical people are working together. You have the farmers, the bikers, the cooks, the parents, and the geeks, right? And they work together in one ecosystem, because you know what is feeding national populism is the split between the cognitive and the physical working class, right? So you have the people mm -hmm. who work on their computer all day, and at five o'clock they leave the office, and then all the migrants come to clean up their mess, and they don't see each other. Yeah. Right. And this this feeds this division that we are that we are experiencing. And so I think the commons can heal this. We create ecosystems rather than, you know, just private companies. So that's what my research was about. So you have the, the base layer of coordination, stigmergy, you know, open accounting systems and supply chains that create ecosystems. And you have contributory accounting, you have flow accounting, and you have thermodynamic accounting integrated in one system. And that allows three things. First, the automatic free coordination. I can see what you do. I can adopt to you. That's the that's the base layer. That's what the Commons has has invented. You know the open source collaboration. Then the second layer is generative markets, and that's where crypto comes in, right? We had dumb money. Now we can have intelligent money like Fishcoin, and it's thermodynamically informed currency that tells you how much you can fish. Nice. And so we need to invent all these kinds of generative markets. And I think that's what radical exchange is trying to do. So I, you know, I applaud this kind yeah. of uh, idea. Of how can we make markets less, you know, exploitative, less extractive, and more generative, right? Because the market has to work for the commons. It's codependent on the commons, and it has to protect the commons. But Absolutely. the market has a function. You know, supply demand has a function. We don't want centralized planning. But then the third layer, that's a bit of centralization in the sense that we want, we want to create a global mechanism that protects the environment and the web of life, right? And so this is what r30.org is trying to do, which I, I really support. So it's called multi-capitalism. And so you have to manage money, people, and nature with responsibility. And there is an accounting system for that. So it's called global thresholds and allocations. So you have scientists who monitor the availability of resources. You know, they look at the average fines, the growth in productivity of its usage, uh, the biocircularity when you use it two and three and four times, what's get lost. And so they have these tables and these tables are contextualized for everyone in the world. Like you are co-op in Barcelona, you know, and you can see the flows, you know, and that's where a uh, hollow chain comes in. That's the idea of mm -hmm. currency, right? Because the accounting from the 13th century, double entry book accounting is a private entity 
that doesn't see the ecosystem. And REA, Resources Event Agents, is a 3D accounting system that doesn't have double entry, but tells you your place in the ecosystem. All right, so we move from private companies to ecosystemic domains of cooperation, and they're run by what I call magisteria of the commons. And they don't exist yet. We have to build them. This is the institution of the future because we have international state system with international organizations. We have transnational capital, you know, the Davos thing. What we don't have is translocal, transnational civic organizations that can protect the commons. You know, this they is will just that, I, that, that, I, that I want you to do. That's what commons oh, no. should be working on. <laughs> you know, it's been amazing talking to you, Michelle. Uh, a lot of wisdom coming through. And uh, I, you know, I thank you for taking interest in, in the common stack and becoming a member of the Trusted Seed and, and uh, diving in with us. I, I hope that we can help, uh, help make that vision a reality. But uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of us. That's why we have the Trusted Seed in the first place. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I think, you know, what we discovered is, you know, it's slow going. There's no rapid revolution. It's just like keep on working and making mistakes and learning. And so what I like about the blockchain space after 10 years, it's still there. It's still working. So, you know, this is revolution. This is not a trend. This is this is this is the infrastructure of the future. Yes. You know, and it doesn't fully work yet. And it's experimental. But that's where we're going. Absolutely. And uh, but all right, great, thank great. You so thank, thank you for you know giving me also like uh, you know the space to talk and and uh, for listening yeah. to me and so yeah. I, you know I hope it's useful.